basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies. They are thrown everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample on the needy, and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over, that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great, and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. I shall, shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about to sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day I will turn, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth with broad daylight, in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head, and I will make it like a mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. And on that day, the lovely virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. And those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. This is word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we hear again the fearsome and dreadful words of judgment from your prophet on your people who have become faithless. Lord, draw us to see and to know and to keep us from being faithless. We pray this through Jesus who redeems us and reconciles us even as we have already sung. Amen. The best known passage in the book of Amos is probably back in chapter 5, verse 24. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This, this was used by Martin Luther King Jr., Jr. at the Lincoln Memorial, part of his speech. And it's a real call for justice as we need to have always. It's the central theme to this book is to have justice among the people, that the rich would not take advantage of the poor, that things would be done legally, that there'd be real justice. But the next most known phrase, I believe, is here in the first verse. This is what the Lord showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. This is a vision. This is just like the other visions that we had in the last chapter. Although those visions were, were terrifying, there was the vision of the locust that came and ate everything. And if that wasn't bad enough, because the prophet said, oh Lord, please, no, how could, how could the nation survive? And then came the next one, it was fire that came and destroyed everything. It was even more terrifying. The third was more ordinary, a plumb line, but it was the plumb line of justice and that God would take and put it against the temple and show it's not in line. It must be knocked over. So judgment is there too. Each one of these 
It's, behold, well, here we have it again, you know, uh, behold, a basket of summer fruit. Now, if you saw a vision of a basket of summer fruit, what would be your reaction? This is not a terrifying vision. Actually, it kind of seems nice. If you're an artist, you might think, still life, maybe I'll paint. Or if you've been around artists, you've seen how many of these bowls of fruit that people do. Still life, that'd be nice. You might also think a bowl of summer fruit is sweet and is a treat. They didn't have refrigeration. They did not have ways to transport fruit from Peru or Israel and get it here because we can have, we have fruit all the time. This was the last of it. This was the summer fruit. And ripe fruit needed to be eaten and enjoyed. That's kind of an important thing to know. When you've got fruit, you eat it. It's not there to just kind of go bad and get rid of it and put more fruit and go get rid of it. Right? So this might be a, a good feeling that you have when you think about summer fruit. But there's a real mixed message with this because it's not just the sweet fruit. There's something very bitter here. It means that summer is over. This is the end. This is the summer fruit at the end of summer. There's nothing coming after this. And after summer comes the autumn and the harvest, but then there's winter. And we've had enough food, we've hoped, to store up in the winter because there's no growing in the winter. Now, winter comes. We are used to it. it it's something we expect. We make room for it. Rhythm in the seasons. And in the winter, when it gets too bad, you can comfort yourself with this thought. Spring is coming. Whether it's a, a groundhog that sees his shadow or whatever. But, you know, it's coming. Summer will come. Uh, summertime, living is easy, as the song goes. And the catfish jumping and whatnot. Uh, but we expect these rhythms. What's being said here, though, is that the summer is ending and winter is coming and spring won't come again. There is going to be judgment. There's going to be destruction. And it's not heralding the death of an individual, but the death of a nation. This nation will disappear. The people see the summer fruit. They don't realize this is the last time they see this. The last opportunity they have. And this is really something I think for us to think about because you never know the last time you're going to be able to do something until after it was the last time. The last time I was able to pick up my child. The last time I was able to see a loved one. The last time I was able to climb this mountain. Or whatever. There's a time when you can't do it again and there is a last time. Last time for everything, but you know, the most important thing is we have opportunities to love the Lord and serve the Lord. And there will be a last time for us here. For people who don't know Jesus, there will be a last time for them to have an opportunity to know him here. Last time to talk to someone about that. Because after that, the fruit rots. Verse 2, Amos, what do you see? a basket of summer fruit. And the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel, and I will never again pass by them. Well, there's the interpretation, the bitterness of it, the hardness of it. This is the last harvest. The northern tribes, they had split away after Rehoboam, after the death of Solomon. Jeroboam made this his kingdom. He set up his worship, which was also idolatrous, and the Lord endured that a long time. And now they were having an economic boom, but that economic boom had to do with the rich oppressing the poor, and the real God was not the Lord. In fact, their love was probably the love of money. Ours is also a culture ruled by the love of money and trusting in money to think that that's what's going to supply what we need. Several parts to this judgment. The most grievous is the very first one. It says that the Lord will no longer be with them. I will never again pass by them. They rejected the Lord. 
The time had come of judgment where they were going to be rejected as a nation. Years, well, they're going to be taken away by an enemy, and, and very soon, this is the Assyrians will come down, they will be removed, they go into dispersion, and they never come back as a nation. While some people will, some of the people of these tribes will be back as individuals, but this is not going to be a nation again. The southern kingdom of Judah is going to be taken into exile by Babylon. But the difference is that's an exile from which they will return and the Lord will bring back the remnant. That will not happen in the northern kingdom. More judgment, death and famine. Well, all these things happen in war, dead bodies. But this is going to be utmost severity. It's going to be an invasion that's going to be like a flood and then finally, what to me is, is the most poignant and chilling, there will be a famine, not of food, but there's going to be a famine of the word of the Lord. The people will seek the word of God and it will not be there for them. There will be no more opening of the word of God. They wait for the word of the Lord, but it, it doesn't come. So with that in mind, here's the reaction that comes from the vision of the bowl of summer fruit. Verse 3, the songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. Now this is the temple at Bethel and also up in Beersheba. This is not the Beersheba down in the south, but up in the north, the, the areas where they had their false worship. So many dead bodies, they are thrown everywhere. Silence. In that day, that's an expression of God's judgment. It's an expression of final judgment. We read about the final judgment in Revelation, but here is a judgment of finality on these people. Is the day of the Lord something to look forward to? And it's interesting because for those who are people following the Lord, it's the day where they have Deliverance, the day when the enemy is destroyed. But for those who are not, they say, let the rocks fall on me to hide me. Let the mountains cover me up because they're terrified to be in the presence of God who brings judgment. And it's not just of an individual, but of the nation. The reactions, so many dead bodies. They're thrown everywhere. Silence. We're not really accustomed to war. I've not been to war. Most of the wars we fought have not been here. In fact, in anyone's memory, events that happen, but the actual wars take place in other places. I've seen movies that depict the carnage of D-Day, and it's bodies everywhere, and all of the soldiers say they, they have a post-traumatic stress that whether it's 50 years later, they still feel that. They still see that. These were people that they knew and loved, brutally killed, death everywhere. That's what is in store. And then it says silence, and it could be Maybe a call for silence in the midst of all this, but a silence because there's a pall of death. It's just silent. All that's happened is over, and all that's left is destruction. No one is left to speak. So many dead bodies, they're thrown everywhere. Silence. Amos tells the people of the vision, and he expounds it, this is the judgment on the wealthy, and we've seen this in the book already. Hear you, hear this, verse 4, who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell again, and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great, and to seal, deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. Now, the, the, the Sabbath is a day of rest. It was a day given to the people. 
that all the people, even the servants, even the animals, would have a day of rest, a day of refreshment, a day to look to the Lord and give thanks. But they didn't want a day of rest. They wanted a day to do what they wanted to do, and what they wanted to do was sell and make money. There was the new moon feast, another special feast where they were supposed to have a time of, of rest and no commerce. And you read through the stories where they're, they, they, they line up you know, the king would say, we're going to, this is in Jerusalem, they would shut the gates. And they're lined up out there, ready to get in. He says, pour something on them, you know, drive them away. That's not what they're supposed to be doing here today. These, all they wanted was money. If they had a slogan on their coin, it wouldn't be in God we trust. Actually, they have a, probably something printed on their idol gods that would say in money we trust. They're all about the money, the silver. And it's not that just, just they loved money, but they used it to cheat other people. Make the ephah small and the shekel big. The ephah is the thing that they measured. Uh, is it like half a bushel? Yeah, an ephah is roughly half a bushel, but they're going to make it smaller. So they're not selling as much for what the money they're taking. And they're making the shekel heavier, so they get more silver for it. So they're not only focused on the money, but they're cheating those that need. They get, first person gets less, they have to pay more for it, and the, the sellers make more money. They sold the poor for a pair of sandals. If they were short and they didn't have enough money to pay, rather than say, well, maybe later, they'd say, no, we're going to, exact this from you. We're going to take and make you work for us, turn you into a slave. And it could be for some a small amount, like a pair of sandals, which again is oppressive. And then selling the chaff for the wheat, well, that's, that's the stuff you're not supposed to eat. You know, the, 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 no, you want to let the chaff go away so you actually have the grain. This is the oppression and severe judgment that comes. Verse 7, the Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account? And everyone mourn who dwells in it. And all of it will rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. The Lord swears by the pride of Jacob. Now, what's the pride of Jacob? It's the Lord. I mean, all swearing oaths are to be made in the aim, name of the Lord. If the Lord makes a, a, a oath or swears by something, he swears by himself. When he cut the covenant with Abraham, he swore by himself. And all things, this is, the Westminster Standards say this too, we only make vows to God. We make vows in the name of God. We don't make vows for other things. But they swear by other gods. They trust in their own wealth. And so judgment comes uh, like a flood. Shall not everyone who mourn dwells in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink like the Nile of Egypt? In the Nile, every August, the, there's, a, there's a, a flood that happens. This is, this is why the, the Egypt became a big area. The Nile would come in, it would flood, that would put silt and better soil on the land, and then it would recede. And then Egypt, really, it was kind of maybe only 10 miles on either side of the river as it went up. Now, people knew, don't build your house right on the banks because, right, that's the fields are going to come in out. They were used to that. When you have this, this normal rhythm, they'd understand it. But what it would do is come and upend things, and they get tossed around, and then they come back down. This is talking about a flood coming in that's not expected. A flood not of water, but of the enemy that would come in, and everything would be turned upside down, and it would destroy it in its path. It's a day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment. Verse 9, 
And on that day, again, this is the, the judgment, the day of the Lord, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Now, the darkening is, again, a sign of judgment. Think back to Egypt. He's been talking about Egypt. Was there darkness in Egypt? It was one of the plagues. It was a three days of darkness. This is judgment. When Jesus hung on the cross, it became dark. There was judgment as well. The light of life hung on the cross to take the sins of the world. And the judgment of God was seen in the darkness. And those who rejected him remained in darkness. In fact, isn't that what it says in John chapter 3? It says that those, they, they, they didn't love the sun because they didn't love the light because it exposed their deeds, which were evil. They wanted the darkness. They loved the darkness. But darkness is judgment. Verse 10, I will turn your feasts into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. And I'll make it like the mourning for an only son. And the end of it like a bitter day. Now, I don't know if you know Psalm 30. I love Psalm 30. There was a song that came out of Psalm 30 that I sang 50 years ago. But let me read a little bit. I will extol you, O Lord, for you've drawn me up and not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried to you for help and you've healed me. O Lord, I, you have brought my soul up from Sheol, from the grave. You restored to me from among those who go down to the pit. Now, this is the end of the psalm, verse 11. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Oh, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. You've turned my mourning into dancing. You've taken off my sackcloth. You've given me gladness. That's what happens when the Lord rescues his people. But here, in this vision, it's the opposite. Those who've abandoned the Lord are under his judgment and no longer under his protection, but under his wrath. Because the Lord who can deliver from the foe can also deliver into the hand of the foe. And that's what happens here. The Lord is holy. The Lord is a consuming fire. What are we to do if we neglect so great a salvation? Sackcloth, symbol of mourning. They take off the good clothes. They put on the sackcloth. Sackcloth, I guess, is kind of like burlap sack. It is something that's rough. It is not something that looks good. It's not something that feels good. And it's done to show grief. Intense mourning. The bald head, shaving of the head. That's a sign of mourning. Putting ashes on the head. Sign of mourning. It's intense mourning, as it says, for an only son. When we lose loved ones, it, it, we, we grieve. But... The loss of an only son is not just the loss of a loved one, it's the loss of the hope of the future. Because there was the continuation. The only son is gone. This is the grief that comes. This is the judgment that comes. This is the bitterness of days. And if that's not enough, it comes to what I think is the most disturbing. There's going to be a famine, not of food or water. They'll be tormenting by the enemies. All that will happen, but there's going to become a famine of the word of the Lord. Verse 11, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east, and they shall run to and fro, 
and seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. And in that day, the lovely young virgin and young men shall faint for thirst. It's through the word that the Lord communicates who he is. It's through the word of God that we understand who he is. If we look out, we can see what we call general revelations. It's all that God has made, you can see, because God has made it, you can understand things about God. But we can't fully understand that because of sin. Here, the scripture is like, like lenses that we put on our eyes, and this is especially, I can especially feel this because I can see you fuzzy bumps out there. I put on the lenses and I can see with the scripture now what was, maybe I couldn't quite understand, but now I really understand that the heavens declare the glory of God. We see this from the scripture, but they don't have the word of God. He speaks still, but they don't hear it. He speaks through all that's been made, but they don't understand it. They look for the word of God, but they won't hear it because they will not be reconciled to God. Even if they look for it. This is terrifying to me. It closes the way for the people to know God. It was by the word of God that all things were made. Life comes from the word of God. The people were 40 years in the desert. And at the end of that, the Lord tells Moses, tell them, you ate the bread of poverty to learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But they'd forgotten that. They'd rejected that. And they thought their life consisted in things and more things. And the more things they had, the better they thought their life was, but it was always not enough. I still remember many years ago now, they were asking Ted Turner, well, how much do you need? Just a little more. Just a little more. Why? Ours is the material, materialistic culture. And I would say that the religion of our land is consumerism. It's buying stuff. And this is not new. This is true in the hearts of people all the time. Jesus taught as well that the, his disciples be on the lookout for this this love of, of money. Your life doesn't depend on those things. From Luke 12, he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He also says in Matthew 6, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both God and money. Guard your heart. I've been listening to a fellow who encourages minimalism over consumerism. And it's really a challenge, you think. What do I really need? It seems a little extreme to get rid of everything but there's so many things I hold on to that are there that I don't need and I'm not sure why I have them. Could they benefit someone else? I almost wonder if a radical approach to things is what's needed. Just like someone who is in AA says, well, I, I, I can't drink. And that solves that problem. And that person's with other people who encourage them and their life changes. What a wonderful thing that is. Something to think about. Breaking the power of consumerism, which 
is a lot deeper and more subtle than I realize. I have learned that I don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, so I spend time in the word of God, and I pray it and sing it and know it, want to make it known. But this judgment of having a famine of the word of God is horrifying to me. And yet there's so many things to deal with it can get pushed out. Other things to distract. So things that clamor for time. May the Lord grant victory in our life that we would spend our time on the things that are valuable. And it's not always reading the word, but living life with the word in your heart and your mind and on your mouth even. The presence of God with you. Otherwise, we become imprisoned by things. Well, the judgment here on Israel is clear. The northern kingdom is clear. They love their idols. They were going to stay with their idols that they'd made. They didn't worship the Lord who redeemed them from Egypt, who blessed them daily with all that they needed. Instead, they worshiped the creature. And then it ends there with verse 14. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, As your God lives, O Dan, as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. They don't swear by the pride of Jacob. They don't swear by the Lord. They swear by the gods that they've made. And then judgment comes with finality. These were the people of God. And there was judgment that came upon them. May God deliver his people from this judgment. May God show us our own hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I read of your judgment of a land that is situated much as ours is. A land with a focus that is much as ours is. And I know that you are the one who raise up rulers and bring down kingdoms that even the hand, the heart of the king is in your hands, that you turn like rivers of water wherever you want. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray first for ourselves, that we would not be taken in, pulled into the pattern of living life to buy and sell, to acquire, to covet, but hearts to share, to love, to give, to give time, to share in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word, your word which is so plentiful with Bibles everywhere, Gideon's placing them in hotels, schools, in churches, on the airwaves. And yet, there is a dearth of hearing the word of God. Other things are deemed more important than the words of life. Oh yes, Lord, keep us close, keep us focused. Keep us interested and joyous in looking at your word and knowing your ways. But use us to draw others in. That they would see the blessedness of peace with you. Growth with you. Christ in them. The real hope of glory. Lord, we do pray for loved ones that they would know. That they would grow. That indeed, as the psalm says, you would turn their mourning into dancing. Take off their sackcloth. Father, we ask for your grace to flow in us, through us, and in our land. And we thank you that you are the sovereign over all. Bless us, we pray. In Christ. Amen. 
I'm going to try to stop this share. It's going to take a minute. But then we'll come back and we'll pray. And may the Lord bless you all up there. And we'll wave to anybody that you can wave at.